Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, SQFI Upcoming Standards Changes and Lessons Learned. My name is Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team at Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc. I'll be facilitating today's webinar and offering technical support to our speakers. Today, we're excited to be welcoming two guest speakers to discuss the topic at hand, Tammy Van Buren and Christy Grzynski of SQFI, and we'll be introducing them both to you shortly. But just before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes to ensure audio quality. All attendees are on mute. However, we do absolutely want to take any questions you might have. So to ask a question, you can go ahead and type it into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar control panel and click send. We'll answer as many of these questions as we have time for at the end of the prepared slides. And there's no need to wait until the end of the presentation to submit your questions. So just send them our way as you think of them. And as I said, we'll answer them once we get through the slides. Um, some of the most frequently asked questions we get include, uh, you know, where can I find a copy of the slides or will a recording be made available? And I'm happy to say that both the slides from today's presentation and a recording of the full broadcast will be made available to you. The slides will be downloadable from the PGRFSI website, and the recording will be posted to the PGRFSI YouTube channel for you to review, or even if you'd like to share the link with someone who couldn't attend the live presentation. But just really quickly, this is what the control panel might look like on your screen. It could differ depending on uh, your device or what OS you're, you're operating on. You can just click the little triangle to the left of the questions tab, and it should open up a little panel with a box for you to type in a question and click that send button at the bottom, and we'll get those on our end and answer as many of them as we can. But now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Paul. He's going to be uh, our uh, head of the conversation here for today. He is our Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Supply Chain at PGRFSI. He joined us back in January of last year and has over 35 years of experience in the hospitality, service, and retail agri-food sectors. Paul's a board member of the OFPA, that's the Ontario Food Protection Association, and he's also an advisory council member with the George Washington University School of Business for their digital marketing certificate program. Uh, before he came to work with PGRFSI, Paul worked for 16 years in the certification industry and had clients in every sector from food safety and supply chain to brand protection and quality. Paul's also worked for many years in management system certification. And prior to that, Paul was a professional chef and a consultant for over 20 years. So Paul, I'll hand things over to you and you can take it away when you're ready. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Hello everyone, welcome to our uh, webinar for today. I'm really excited about this as we get to talk about upcoming changes to uh, SQF version 9, as well as some of the lessons uh, learned over the last couple of uh, months of the implementation. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. So thank you again for joining. So moving forward at this time, I would like to introduce you to a couple of industry colleagues of mine, uh, Tammy Van Buren and Christy Krasinski from SQF. Let me just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Tammy has been the uh, and is manager of compliance for SQFI since November of 2019. Uh, she's held recent uh, positions there as quality manager and SQF practitioner as well for Treehouse Foods, as well as DNW Fine Pack. Tammy has almost 30 years of experience in quality control in the automotive and food industries. She teaches classes in her spare time, preparing people to take the ASQ certified class as quality engineers and technicians. And of course, Christy Gerzinski, she's made a long career of helping food companies create systems that ensure uh, safe production of food and including 11 years working with the National Restaurant Association Serve Safe program. She is now the technical director for the Food uh, Industry Association's Safe Quality Food Institute. And Christy is responsible for supporting the delivery of a consistent globally recognized food safety and quality management program uh, based in a sound scientific principles. She particularly uh, shines at developing, uh, you know, wonderful training programs and otherwise making complex topics very approachable. With that, I believe, Christy, you're going to kind of kick it off today. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us. I'm going to be interacting with you throughout the presentation as well, and uh, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Paul and Amy. I really appreciate the wonderful introduction. Tammy and I are very excited to be with you all here today. Thank you for so many of you uh, showing up today to join us. And thank you to Perry Johnson, PJ, our FSI, for this opportunity to talk to you about Edition 9. Oh yeah, all right, here's what we're gonna be talking about today. Give you a little overview of uh, the changes to Edition 9. Uh, maybe you're, you haven't you looked at it yet, or you have and you have some questions. As Amy said, go ahead and uh, type your questions at any point in time into that question and answer box, um, and we'll be sure to address it. So um, talk a little bit about the, the changes to the code in general aspects, and then we're going to uh, talk about the implementation timeline, touch on some of the frequently asked questions and where you can go to get more information or if you need some assistance. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And with that, we'll head over to our first topic. So what are some of the structural changes to the SQF code for edition nine? So if you've taken a look at edition nine, um, and uh, you can raise your hand if you have, but I can't see, see you. So um, if you have taken a look at it, you'll notice that it looks different than other versions of the code, than the previous versions, right? Looks a little different, looks a little freshened up, a little sleeker. Um, you also notice there might be even more codes than before. The structural changes involve the creation of custom codes for several scopes, uh, so, some new scopes pulled out and, and now they've been given their own code. So we have livestock, aquaculture, pet food, animal feed and animal production and dietary supplements. A uh, lot of industry needs for those, so we decided to pull them out and make them their own standalone standards. Additionally, based on feedback from SQF stakeholders like yourselves, we took the opportunity to streamline the technical elements of the code to better group similar elements and reduce redundancies. So this just gives you a quick visual of what it looks like in comparison to edition 8.1. So where before we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight codes. Now we have all of those on the right. And uh, you'll see that they are kind of color coded um, so that you know where you lie. Um, so uh, anything in primary production is in that kind of yellowy green. Anything manufacturing is in that manufacturing blue. Uh, storage and distribution, food packaging standalone, the purple quality code. And we also still have our three codes, food retail, food service, and fundamentals. Those didn't change because they were new for edition 8.1 didn't really need to go un undergo much change so those haven't changed for edition 9 but they still remain they're still available um, and you can see the associated modules uh, or food sector categories I should say yeah those are the food sector categories there and here's a picture of the exterior and this kind of gives you a little overview um, of some of the icons that we use. So you have the same look and feel and then there's little icons that help to denote your code. And uh, we do that to help you determine which tools and code you need. Christy, I have a quick question. Uh, when are the checklists and guidance documents gonna be posted or um, accessible for all of our listeners? That's a number one question, probably the, the reason you asked it first. Everyone wants to know when the guidance documents will be available, uh, when can I have those, and same with the checklist, because the checklists are handy to do a gap assessment with at your site or prepare yourself for edition nine using those checklists. Well, both uh, groups of documents are available uh, on our website, sqfi.com, it's down there in the right-hand corner, sqfi.com, and we have checklists for all of those codes um, that you see there, yeah, I'm looking at my list, and yep, uh, checklists for all those um, 
codes that you see there. And we also have a bunch of guidance documents out there. And we took a little bit of a different direction with our guidance documents this time. Um, and we're, we're focusing on not just the code element, but the entire program. So like the entire uh, contract manufacturers or uh, risk assessment as a topic, proficiency testing. So there's a, a whole host of those available to talk about the whole scope of that program, let's say. And those are available on the SQFI website. Perfect, thank you. One more slide is that the interior got a facelift as well. Nice and pretty with white space um, and nice and easy to read. Downloadable from the website. All right, and now we get to uh, my big question here. What are some of the technical changes to Part A in Edition 9? So let's kind of highlight those. Okay, so number one, top of the list, change the scoring from 10 points to 5 for a major nonconformity. We've had lots of discussions around this. People want to know, why did we do that? And are scores going to go up because we made that change? And, uh, you know, that's something that we're going to be looking at uh, and monitoring very closely as Edition 9 um, audits come in. And I'll be reviewing that to see. Uh, but really what we wanted to achieve there by reducing that scoring was we just felt like that auditors are hesitant. Uh, to assign a, mi uh, a major sometimes. They'll write three or four minors, but they won't make that jump to that 10-point major, uh, which would denote that there's a systemic failure. And we felt this was really doing a disservice to the sites uh, when they had a nonconformance that really was a systemic failure and, sh failure and should have been addressed uh, as such and looked at the bigger picture. So hopefully we will see a lot of those multiple minors now turn into uh, a major nonconformity as they should have been all along um, because the definition for minors and majors didn't change, but we just hope that auditors will be less reluctant to make that jump um, because it's not as big of a points change uh, going from a minor to a major now. So we're going to be monitoring that closely. Also, there is no longer a desk audit required for initial certifications. And, you know, some people may say, hey, Tammy, why would you take away that desk audit? You know, it was really good for um, sites to, to have that non-scored desk audit to be able to correct some things um, before they had their on-site audit. And what we heard from our stakeholders was in a lot of cases that uh, the desk audit wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily needed. And even those sites that did have the desk audit did not necessarily take advantage of those free nonconformances um, to, to evaluate and correct. So um, I just recently ran the numbers and, and if any of you all know me, you know I am all about the numbers. And so I ran the numbers and looked at the scores uh, for those facilities that did well on their desk audit. They also did well on their on-site audit for Edition 8.1. And the same goes on the flip side. For those sites that did not do well on their desk audit, they also did not do well on their uh, on-site audit. So the desk audit really wasn't, you know, helping them um, to, to be better on their on-site audit. It was, you know, really kind of, you know, just followed the same lines there. Uh, we did remove the audit duration table. So you will no longer find that uh, in part A of the code. We did include the option for remote audit activities um, because um, the, uh, the, the GFSI included remote audit activities as an option. So that is now in there as well. And then we clarified activities uh, for when a site is suspended or when they fail, as an, au fail an audit. And you can see that uh, picture there with that if then table. So Tammy, I have a, there's a lot to unpack on this slide here. I, I do have a couple of questions. Okay. When, when you uh, refer to the desk audit being removed, uh, just for clarity, I believe that a lot of the, well, all of the activities that were previously separated uh, during the desk audit will still be reviewed and required, but just combined with the initial certification, correct? Right, and, and that's a great question because we um, have gotten that question a lot 
Um, and, and people have even said, will our initial audit now get longer in duration because there is no longer a desk audit? But what I explained to people is that, that there was never the intention that the desk audit would cover certain things and then the on-site audit would just cover certain things. Your initial certification audit should have been a full system audit. And so right. it should have covered all of those things that the desk audit covered anyway. You know, some sites may go a year between their desk audit and their initial certification audit. So it should have been a full audit um, anyway. So, so yes, so everything will be inclusive in that on-site audit. Okay, and then my, my other question is around the uh, audit duration table. I'm certainly clear on how we plan to manage this as a certification body, but in your opinion, how do you think the other CBs or all CBs should calculate audit duration without the table? Yeah, so uh, I had meetings with all of our 35 CBs uh, back in November and December of 2020. We did virtual, you know, since we were uh, still in the middle of the pandemic there, but we did virtual office visits. And that was one of the questions I asked of all of our CBs because I wanted to clarify and have an understanding of what their plan was going forward. So I did uh, understand from all of our CBs that they will continue to use the audit duration table from 8.1. There's nothing in edition nine that says they can't or some version of it. So um, a lot of them are using that one as a starting point and then they're modifying it uh, to make it um, fit their, their you know, business model. Um, but from everything I've heard, all of our certification bodies will have some type of table or form that will assist them in calculating the audit duration. It won't be just uh, throw a dart at a dartboard and, and you know, uh, pick something. It, it will be um, based on a variety of things that are listed there in Edition 9 in the code. Great. Thank you. That was me, sorry. And back to Christy. So what about the system elements? Uh, what kind of notable technical changes were made in module two? So let's go ahead and go over some of those. And while I'm flipping the slide, I was gonna mention also, we have on our website uh, documents that map out the changes. So you can compare 8.1 to nine. Um, those are always very handy and I use those quite often. Uh, myself so that you know you know like okay so this element didn't go away but where did it go so what you'll see in the system elements is some uh, grouping some nice um, a combination so some of the elements were were combined it really didn't go away one of the ones that I'm talking about is food safety culture you know that that was added uh, due to a change by GFSI so that was added to our our standard and um, a lot of those elements were already in the system elements but they were now just combined and put together under the heading of food safety culture so you'll see um, that certain certain aspects of food safety culture uh, were were already part of the code. And of course, I'm trying to flip to it real fast. Uh, adequate resources, um, making sure that uh, employees are properly uh, educated, and uh, sh you know, sharing food safety incidents. All of that was part of the code before. Um, not many changes uh, all around, um, but uh, talking about requirements for product changeover due to the nature of um, the, the number of recalls around product changes or you know inaccurate labels or the wrong label on the wrong product number one cause of recall recalls globally um, from from the <laughs> I should say from my perspective so looking at like uh, Australia and Canada and and other countries mislabeling of product is is within the top three uh, in many countries and so we added this requirement so that the site um, you know, takes a, a stronger look at those label situations and, um, you know, where they can assure that the right label is on the right product and that the label itself is correct. So that's what we mean by label reconciliation. It's not just counting uh, product and labels. It's, it's making sure that 
you have a process in place to that the right label is on the right package with the right product with the right information um, added some additional requirements around internal testing and sampling and uh, some changes in module seven around uh, the plants and how they are um, well, product development in the plant world is essentially what it is. So not knowing who's on the phone, I won't dive into that one too far, but uh, definitely a little bit of changes in module seven around uh, around that. Um, so just a couple of questions here. Maybe I'll uh, start with Tammy. T Tammy, how do you think food safety culture uh, could be or should be interpreted by the auditor? Well, I'm gonna put in a plug here for our new guidance documents that okay. Chris mentioned earlier. So uh, we created a guidance document for food safety culture. And, uh, you know, instead of putting out that one long 180 page document that goes element by element and, and give, gives you all this really way over kill on the information, we decided to go with these, um, these shortened versions that focus on specific topics. So, I, you know, that one on food safety culture is just so um, information packed with uh, the things that, you know, the auditors would be looking at. And so for each one of those guidance documents, we take you to the, uh, on the road to Rio, as we call it. And so we're looking at records, we're looking at interviews, and we're looking at observations. So some of the records that they would be looking for for, for food safety culture, there's not anything new after you know i came up with that list of what kind of records would we look for for food safety culture there's nothing new on the list so are the resources available is the company you know investing uh, in food safety you know are there capital projects involved um, you know, are those job descriptions available that, you know, empower people uh, to speak up when there is a, a food safety concern or a potential concern? And then we look at interviews. Who are they going to talk to? Well, with food safety culture, an auditor could talk to absolutely anybody uh, at the site when they're um, doing the audit. And so, you know, some of the questions uh, we dive into is, you know, uh, it, tell me about a time when you brought up a potential food safety concern and what was the reaction of management or you know tell me about a time where you identified you know a food safety problem that was occurring and and how did management resolve that so you know looking at the 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 whole picture there and then observations just watching how people perform their job and you know observations as simple as you know does somebody uh, keep their work area neat, organized, are things put away? Do people just walk by trash and um, and products sitting on the floor without picking it up and throwing it away? Um, so just observing, I, you know, because I always say food safety culture is really people doing the right things when they think nobody's watching. So, so those are just some of the things that I think the auditor is going to look for when they're evaluating food safety culture. That's an amazing response and so many uh, great nuggets there as well, Tammy. I mean, I think not only just food safety culture, but culture in general. Uh, so thanks for, for that. Now, Christy, uh, what tests or do you have any examples of tests you think that might fall under the new requirement for uh, internal sampling and testing? So I think what most folks are concerned about um, is, is that requirement that the, the, any internal laboratories uh, follow or, or um, I want to find the right word so that I don't say it correctly, it need to be compliant with ISO 17025. And that's, a, a, you know, your good laboratory practices. And, and I think a lot of folks are worried about what does that require? Does it require I'm a, my, my internal lab is, is accredited to 17025? And that's not what this is seeking. Um, if you're using an external lab, you certainly want to, but internal labs, we're really looking at between this and the requirement for the proficiency testing is to make sure that you're checking to be sure that the test that you're doing are correct right so we verify a lot of things that we do we monitor and we verify um, this is just another uh, 
action of monitoring or verifying to make sure that your lab tests, any internal lab testing like your micro, your chem testing, your finished product testing that you may do in-house is accurate. So you're just doing a verification step here. Um, and uh, we have, in, again, a very nice um, guidance document that talks about this and what's uh, required uh, within the scope of proficiency testing to make sure that the lab staff uh, are, are uh, consistent and accurate, as well as the internal lab itself as far as the good laboratory practices. That's great, thank you so much. Okay, now we are going to look about uh, the technical element changes for modules 7, 10, and 11. Um, there are some notable changes there, so let's just hit those real quick. Uh, we do have an additional requirement for adequate ventilation. Uh, we added a requirement for ambient air testing for high-risk processes. Um, we did um, make an accommodation for preventive controls in the storage and distribution and feed standards. And then there were some additional requirements put in for water testing uh, in the primary produce standard. Tammy, how, how do technical changes that you've just mentioned make it into the new edition? Yeah, so there are different ways that we um, add some of these technical uh, changes, such as what you see there. So, for example, on that first bullet point, additional requirement for adequate ventilation. Uh, I, again, I'm all about the numbers. So when I analyze data from the last three years, you know, I always look at our top nonconformances. So the top nonconformances in ventilation, uh, or I'm sorry, the top, top critical nonconformances the top uh, major nonconformances and the top minor nonconformances. When I look back over the last several years, ventilation is the only one that made um, the critical list every single year. And so, you know, we would look at and evaluate those top nonconformances and, you know, add some additional requirements or strengthen the code uh, around that to try to, uh, you know, make sure that sites are, you know, um, you know, following what they need to do to, to produced uh, safe food. And so ventilation, you know, kind of came, came from that. And then that ambient air testing, uh, that came out of the working group. You know, we have working groups for every single code when we get ready to do a, a new addition. You know, I highly recommend anybody, uh, and again, anybody, because we take all kinds of stakeholders. We have certification bodies, we have trainers, we have consultants, we have certified sites uh, that work uh, or, or sit on these working groups to help uh, write the next edition of the code. And so this one came out of the working group and, and it actually came out um, as ambient air testing for all processes. And then when it went through the public comment period last July, uh, people were questioning, well, why would you do it for all processes? Shouldn't it be for high risk only? And so there was actually an update made before the code was published in October to add that it's only for high risk processes. But that came out of the working group. Uh, and then, you know, something like additional requirements for water testing and primary produce. All I'm going to say is think leafy greens recalls. And uh, you'll, you know, hopefully know what I'm talking about uh, and how, you know, we had quite a few recall events in the last couple of years that were related to leafy greens that the root cause analysis went back to the water that was used on those farms. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of different ways that we uh, put new technical requirement or changes into the code. Thanks, Tammy. All right, back over to me. Uh, well, this is the uh, question you've all been waiting for. When will sites need to comply with Edition 9? So if you haven't heard already, implementation date, so the date that uh, certification bodies will begin uh, auditing you, the site, to the Edition 9 code is, was May 24th. Um, so hopefully you are ready and prepared and uh, ready at a moment's notice when that auditor shows up, right? So we gave you about seven months to take a look at the, at the code and the change documents and uh, we are ready to go to, to begin. And some of those initial audits have started uh, already at the end of May. 
Uh, Christy, quick question for you. Uh, how will any previous unannounced audits fit into the, um, you know, the change in the unannounced audit requirement in version nine? That is a very good question. That's a good question because uh, with the pandemic, um, you know, having to the ability to do unannounced audits was challenged. So uh, with edition nine, uh, the CBs will be working with their sites to establish when their first unannounced uh, Edition 9 audit will be. Um, so there are some areas of the world that aren't as opened up as uh, we are here in the U.S., and there may even still be some pockets of the U.S. that uh, uh, may not be open as well. So, um, so with some of those lockdowns and travel restrictions, um, you know, the CBs are going to work with the sites individually to set up those dates and make it happen. Great. Okay, so I do have some advice for how you can begin implementing your Edition 9 changes in case you haven't started already. So hopefully, um, though that you are well on your way uh, to implementing Edition 9, especially those that you know, have their audits coming up soon, um, but um, you know, hopefully you are uh, already there. I'm gonna ask Christy to advance that slide so we can get those best practices up there. Uh, so one of the things I would suggest is complete a gap analysis. Um, to uh, identify those changes needed, um, you know, making sure that you have some type of a register there um, to determine, uh, you know, and monitor when you've, you know, made all those changes and those corrective actions have been implemented. You know, number three there, I, I would just put that really, I, if I were to rearrange this list uh, in order of importance, I would put number three there as the first one. Complete your internal audit. Uh, again, going back to those numbers that I love so much, uh, we found that there's a significant difference in scoring for those sites that uh, get no nonconformances in internal audits versus those sites that do get a nonconformance uh, in internal audits. Uh, as a matter of fact, for those sites that get no nonconformance in uh, internal audits, again, this was a, to edition 8.1, but it would, it would also apply to edition nine. There was a five point reduction for those sites that got a minor in internal audits. So minor obviously is only worth one point, but they scored on average five points lower if they got a minor in internal audits. And then we went a great big jump 30 points lower for those sites that got a major in internal audit. So there, I just can't stress enough the importance of an internal audit and getting that done. And that, that really is one of the best tools to get from one edition to the next. Um, you know, make sure, just a reminder there, document those uh, SQF practitioner meetings. You know, you have to have those a minimum of monthly um, and making sure that you're keeping minutes of those meetings, um, making sure that the, you know, the entire management team uh, is involved in this process and, and make it, you know, make it a, a, a party. Everybody is involved. You know, food safety is not just uh, the responsibility of the practitioner or the quality department, it is everybody's responsibility. And that will help you with that food safety culture question as well. Um, you can use a third party to help. So um, just because we, you know, we say that, you know, the, um, the, in, the um, desk audit's no longer required, you certainly can have a third party come in and uh, do a pre-assessment uh, and um, verify whether you're ready or not. So you can certainly do that. And then again, celebrate your success and uh, be ready for that first edition nine audit. And Tammy, I've uh, you know had many many discussions with customers and uh, and uh, clients who have begun preparing for edition nine, and I often find that those conversations tend to go in the same direction. Uh, so you know, for example. Have you reviewed the key changes to Edition 9 as it relates to your site? What do you think is going to be your biggest impact to food safety? What do you think is going to be your biggest challenge to your site? What are some of your thoughts around this? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can't tell you how much just, you know, reading the code. I am a very big uh, uh, supporter of reading the code. And I know, you know, sometimes it's it's a little bit boring. We did try to, you know, with Edition 9, as Christy talked about some of those uh, interior changes uh, that we went with, you know, even just more white space on the page, uh, but also the uh, working groups reworded the code in a lot of cases, not to change the intent, but for the sole purpose of making it easier to read. So read the code, identify those key changes. Christy mentioned the change documents that are available on uh, the website. You know, we have lots of, um, you know, webinars that SQF has done. We have micro, what we call micro webinar series that we did that talked about some of the new edition nine changes, you know, our new guidance documents, everything's there. The resources are there. So just you know use those resources but um but yeah they're everybody's full of questions and so uh we've been entertaining quite a few on how do i get ready so no that's great thanks all right so and getting towards the end of our discussion here are there any helpful tips we we have as well be getting been getting a lot of these questions and you can tell that our, our um, uh, presentation is based on those questions that we have been getting from sites but uh, we you know we've been asked how do you prepare and so we have a couple of uh, tips for you one is don't wait don't wait until it's time for your audit um, you know site the audit are auditing to edition nine now. Don't wait until uh, close to your uh, audit date to prepare. Uh, start now. Take a look at some of those tools that we have for you. Like I said, the uh, checklist is a great tool to use to conduct a gap assessment. Um, and we have one, if I'm not mistaken, that has both uh, edition 8.1 and 9 so you can see uh, you know where some of those gaps might be seek advice and focus on the intent of the code requirement I think sometimes um, you hear rumors and uh, you, you're talking to other practitioners and uh, you know we get some crazy questions and I ask where in the world did you hear that and uh, I know it's not in the code so look at the code look at the intent Tent of the code. And like I said, use some of those tools and resources that we have. Just take a moment to look at all of those that are on our website. And I do think we have another slide on it coming up um, on, on those resources. But, um, you know, there's forums out there. Now, you know, Tammy and I, if you have a question, feel free to reach out or you can reach out to our info uh, website. But there are um, a variety of means to get yourselves prepared and get get your site prepared so that you feel comfortable with edition nine. So jump into it now um, and, and you'll be better off for it. All right, so we've already touched on this a little bit, but where can you go to get more information? Bonus question, da 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 da. And Christy's going to bring up the uh, website there, again, sqfi.com, webinars, checklists, code change documents, guidance documents. It says coming soon, but you know what? The first wave of them are out there. So there are about 20 guidance documents. Uh, all of the new requirements for Edition 9, I believe, have a guidance document on them, plus some of your old favorites, um, things like corrective action and preventive action. They're there as well. Uh, and then we're getting ready to do the next wave. So you'll see another 15 to 20 uh, topical guidance documents that'll be hitting uh, the website in the next few weeks. And so check back often because that con uh, content is changing all the time. And so um, reach out absolutely and and get those resources. Don't don't do it alone. There's there's lots of help out there to be had. And I think we've got one more slide uh, from SQFI that will show you the contact information. There is our general info box at sqfi.com, uh, as well as our 
phone number. You can reach out to us. Um, they can direct you to me or Christy if you have a, a specific question for one of us, and they can uh, send that information along. So again, um, you know, reach out if you have uh, questions or comments. You know, we're we are here to help. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Paul, and uh, then we'll get to some questions and answers here at the end. Great, thank you so much. And thank you both so much. That was uh, very informative. And I know uh, I speak on behalf of all of our listeners, that was uh, very appreciated. I'm sure that our audience has a lot of questions. If you haven't already done so, please post your question. But at this point, Amy, as always, back to you. Absolutely, as Paul said, get those questions in. We are ready to answer as many as we have time for. But quickly, I wanted to mention some of our upcoming webinars. We've got two coming up next week. So as with all of our webinars, uh, registration is free and we encourage you all to sign up and see what's going on with Global Gap. And um, Dr. William Lee is coming back for another webinar uh, from the Angiogenesis Foundation. But you can check out the full listing of webinars at uh, pgrfsi.com slash webinars. And I did add the contact info for both uh, SQFI and PDRFSI on this screen, just in case you wanted to write that down. Uh, if you had a question that maybe you didn't want to ask live on the air or if it's very complicated, please feel free to reach out. But let me go ahead and see what questions we've got in the question box here. Um, all right, here's a great one that's actually really relevant to that last those last couple of slides that uh, Christy and Tammy shared. Uh, Stephanie is wondering if there are any version 9 training materials in Spanish. Um, so any uh, foreign language uh, training resources out there as far as edition 9 goes? Yeah, this is Christy. Yeah, thanks for asking that. I was going to throw that uh, in there at the end, and, and I completely forgot. Uh, we have wonderful training tools uh, offered by our training centers, and um, the, the new Implementing SQF Systems course uh, takes this kind of systems approach where, uh, you know, uh, it helps the site to understand the programs that make up the uh, SCF system and how they're interrelated. And um, so that implementing class, even if you took it before, you might consider taking it again because there's a different approach, plus you'll talk about uh, addition nine. But specific to the question that uh, Stephanie asked, we will have some resources available in Spanish. A lot of this is being translated right now. And I know some of my training materials uh, will Will be ready mid-June um, and then uh, besides the codes in Spanish we'll be translating a lot of the additional documents as well so it always just takes a little time but Spanish is always our first priority so so stay tuned to the website and you'll start seeing that coming uh, very shortly all right, great. We have a question here from Nadine. Um, Nadine is wondering in 2.4.4.2, please elaborate more on the proficiency test for staff conducting analyses. All right, this is Christy again. So maybe I'll have uh, Tammy help me out a little bit here. But in terms of proficiency testing, again, you're just verifying um, that the test is being done correctly. Now, Tammy, I'll let you go ahead and go a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll dive into the proficiency testing. So, um, you know, prof proficiency testing, as you all know, is not new for Edition 9. It was actually implemented a few years ago uh, with the Edition uh, 8 uh, changes and so proficiency testing has been around, but it is still. I think I I think I commented in one uh, webinar that it's it's like 20, 20 of the most misunderstood words in the SQF code uh, is that sentence there on proficiency testing. And so um, you know proficiency testing is where you are actually comparing your lab to other labs to make sure that. Uh, you can get a result that is similar uh, to other labs on whatever uh, food safety test that you're doing. And so uh, if you check out some of the webinars um, that are available on 
uh, our website. I do have a slide that I've created for proficiency testing. Uh, it uses an is is not matrix. And so hopefully it will help you to identify better. So, so what is proficiency testing? It is uh, calibration. Uh, like I said, it's, co it's comparing your test results to other labs. Um, not comparing your own people to each other to make sure they're consistent. That's not what it is. It is not interlaboratory, okay? Um, but, it, you know, some people confuse it with training. They think, well, I've trained my people, so that's proficiency testing. And it's not. It is not training. It is calibration. And so, um, you know, I suggested uh, on a recent webinar that I did that if you will you know, get on to the internet and search, seek out those uh, ISO 17025 accredited um, organizations. And, you know, I found one that I went to their website. They had a handy dandy little searchable database. I put in proficiency testing and it automatically returned like 50 companies that do nothing but proficiency, proficiency testing. Um, there is, um, you know, lots of resources out there. Uh, again, just remember proficiency testing is for food safety uh, test. It is not for quality tests. I have people all the time try to do proficiency testing on sensory. Well, sensory is not about food safety. Sensory is about quality. So proficiency testing doesn't apply to that. Um, so definitely reach out there. Also, we have uh, an older uh, video on our SQF YouTube channel um, that addresses proficiency testing from back uh, when edition eight came out and it is still relevant today. So if you dig out that um, SQF video off of our YouTube channel uh, on proficiency testing, it will go through the whole statistical analysis of proficiency testing because that's what proficiency testing is. It is a statistical analysis of your lab results versus uh, multiple other labs. So um, check that out. Again, reach out to me uh, if you've still got questions, um, because that is one of the most frequently answered questions by me is um, how do I do proficiency testing? So I'd be glad to go into more in depth. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a follow-up question in the same vein from Wanda. Uh, Wanda is asking, um, if my facility does in-house pH, moisture, and salt percentages, would those need to be validated or would they fall under proficiency testing? Um, so the, the, the difference whether they would fall under proficiency testing or not is are you doing those for a food safety reason, or are you doing it for quality? So um, for some industries, pH is a food safety test. Um, the, the product has to be at a certain pH to be food safe. Um, but I, I came out of an industry where we did pH testing um, because it was for quality. So if the pH um, was not quite right, then the product didn't process right and when it got to the end of the line it tasted terrible so we did it for quality so you would have to analyze each one of those um, for your specific product to determine uh, if it is food safety related or if it's quality related and so um, yeah so and then your question about validation so um, you know one of the things that I did uh, with my edition 8.1 book and I have yet to do it with edition 9 um, but I will do it is I went through and highlighted everywhere where it said verification in one color and I highlighted everywhere where it said validation in another color so it really jumped out at me the places where I needed to validate something versus verify something or in the case of where I needed to do both. Um, I also will tell you that we have updated our glossary for edition 9. Proficiency testing for the first time is defined there and that may help you um, understand proficiency testing a little better and then also we updated our um, definitions for verification and validation and so you might find some inf uh, very good, useful information uh, in the glossary as well. So check that out. And again, if you have more questions uh, and you have specific um, questions, you can certainly reach out. All right, great. We have a question here from Janie. Um, Janie is looking for clarification. Um, in addition, nine, what is considered a high-risk process? 
Well, hey, I'd go back to that glossary again because we did update some definitions uh, in the glossary for high risk. And actually, I think we have, um, yeah, we do, we have three. So we have high risk area, high risk food, and high risk processes. And so, you know, something may meet, uh, you know, the definition of all three of those, or you may be a low risk product that has a high risk area or a high risk process. So, um, yeah, definitely check those out and see what applies specifically to your facility. Um, because just because you have a high risk product doesn't necessarily mean you have a high risk area or a high risk process. So um, check those out and uh, see what is really applicable for your, your particular site. All right, great. We have a two-parter here. Um, this one is from Greg. Greg is asking, um, how do you see Edition 9 changes impacting audit scores in 2021? And also, do you anticipate a shift in the top non-conformances for 2021 based on the changes? Um, yeah, so, okay. So, uh, Christy, feel free to jump in anytime. Um, <laughs> It's a total Tammy question. This is actually Tammy's job. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we we can speculate on scores. Um, we can. Um, we have been on an upward um, swing for the last several years um, that um, shows that we're getting, you know, higher average scores every year. And that has increased again um, during the pandemic. And so, you know, I'm always asking the question, you know, are we getting higher scores because our facilities are getting better or are we getting higher scores um, because, you know, maybe we're we're missing something or, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, kind of letting some things slide. And so, I, you know, I really don't know the answer to that question. Um, but for edition nine, I am um, going to be monitoring that closely because of the change from the, the scoring of a major from 10 to 5. A lot of people believe that scores will increase yet again uh, for uh, 2021. I personally think scores are going to go down a little bit um, because there are new requirements. So you've got that whole food safety culture thing. You've got the internal lab thing. Um, you have a lot of requirements around the label um, changeovers and reconciliation. So there's a lot of new things in addition nine that I think some people may struggle with that will result in more non-conformances. But I just have a feeling that some of our auditors are really going to make that um, jump from you know, uh, issuing three or four minor non-conformances to a systemic uh, non-conformance or a major, uh, which would result in the five points. So I really just in I just have, my gut tells me that scores are going to go down slightly for 2021. Uh, so and could also be related some to the pandemic as well, um, with sites having gotten extensions and you know auditors not having been in there for 18 months. Uh, I think um, we are seeing some lower scores because of that. So I really feel like at the end of the year, this time next year, we're going to be talking about those lower scores for uh, 2021. So, so that's the first part of the question. And then those top nonconformances. As I said, I've analyzed uh, the top nonconformances for the last three years. And uh, in 2018, the top nonconformances were slightly different um, because there were some new requirements. Um, that had come in in 2018. And so you saw something like, um, I think food fraud kind of made the top 10 and a couple of those things, uh, monthly uh, SQF practitioner meetings with um, the site management, I think that kind of edged up, you know, into the top 10. So you saw some of those new requirements and I think we will see the same thing for 2021. I think we will see um, food safety culture. I think that might be uh, in the in the top 10 and those lab requirements. I really think maybe with the change to the internal lab, I think we may see proficiency testing, even though it's not new, I think we may see that climb up on the list a little bit. So, um, you know, the last two years, uh, 2019, 2020, no real changes in the top 10. I think, as a matter of fact, the top 10 minors in 2020 was also the same top 10 minors in 2019, um, because there weren't any real changes from edition 8 to edition 8.1. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think we're going to see some new stuff. I think we're going to be talking about different stuff next year. I hope so. 
<laughs> Great question, Greg. Um, all right, there's a question here from Dia. Um, she wonders, um, why does there have to be a practitioner substitute? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, and again, we say that's a new requirement, a backup practitioner, um, but it's not really a new requirement. You know, the code always said, you know, going back several years, that you had to have backups for key personnel, and your SQF practitioner really is a key personnel. And so you should have already had that backup practitioner in place, um, but now edition nine, it spells it out specifically. Not only do you have to have a backup, but it has to be a trained backup. And so, um, you know, we said the backup has to have the same uh, training requirements as the, the full-time practitioner. And the reason being is that many times, and I have seen this in my work as the compliance manager, I have seen this many times. The, um, the SQF practitioner, you know, especially during this pandemic, you know, maybe they did catch COVID and they were out for several months. And then suddenly nobody's there to back it up and sites struggled with um, their food safety programs, you know, during the pandemic, because they didn't have that trained backup um, to handle everything that, that comes in in the absence of the practitioner. And we also understand that um, smaller sites, that will be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but um, I do know I've uh, seen a lot of our smaller sites who have already um, got their backups identified and they've also, you know, been going through HACCP training. And so I've been hearing a lot of good things about people that are preparing uh, for edition nine. But I, I just I just ask the question, how could you not have a backup SQF practitioner, you know, all the all these years, you know, because it's it's just too important not to have. Um, so. So, yeah. So um, so it's it's. It's brought up and it's elevated. It's there in black and white now, whereas before it was kind of hidden in some of those um, that management commitment uh, requirements. But now it spells it out specifically. Absolutely. All right. I, I'm seeing one more question left in the in the queue here. So if you had any other questions that you'd thought of, um, please go ahead and get those in. Um, otherwise, we will have this last question, then we'll wrap things up for the day. Uh, this last question is from Allison. Um, Allison is asking, uh, what do you think will be the biggest challenge for sites and auditors uh, with the new quality code? Okay, well, I guess I will take that one too. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite the talker, you guys, so uh, so so I'm jumping in there. But I'm going to take the quality code because I actually led the working group that rewrote the quality code. So um, you know, we we tried to uh, align it again with the changes that were made to the uh, food manufacturing code. Uh, so you'll see a lot of things where the, the code is easier to read, I think, and easier to understand. Uh, we did open up, um, you know, some of that terminology that in my mind makes me think big companies. So, so there were places where it would say you need to adhere to customer, regulatory, or corporate requirements. And we tried to take that word corporate out and replace it with company. So, you know, maybe you have company requirements. Um, so that would fit even if it were a little, you know, uh, organization that only had 10 employees, you know, you're still a company, you still have requirements, um, but it doesn't, you know, when I hear the word corporate, it makes me think big company, you know, with hundreds, thousands of people. And so we just tried to make the language a little bit more friendly. Uh, we also made it a standalone code. So for those of you out there that may have a different GFSI food safety certificate, you can now come to SQF and get an SQF quality certificate. And so, uh, so we, you know, again, took out language that was specific to a uh, specific reference to the SQF code. So now it just says instead of uh, should be in line with your SQF food safety code, it now just says uh, it should be in line with your food safety system, you know, whatever that may be. So, um, so yeah, you know, we made it hopefully easier to read and understand. So uh, I'm very proud of the quality code and I'm looking forward to seeing some of those certificates come in for sites that have other GFSI uh, or technically equivalent um, food safety uh, certificates. 
All right, great. I think that was the last question. I didn't see, I didn't see any more come in. So I guess we'll wrap things up for today. Uh, Christy, Tammy, thank you again so very much for taking the time to talk with everyone today. Very informational. Super excited to see what else comes out for uh, you know materials and webinars from you guys. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees today for taking the time to join. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you came in late, if you have a, a colleague or a cohort who was unable to attend live, uh, we will have the recording of today's webinar posted to our YouTube channel. And you are more than welcome to share that around. Uh, you can download the slides from our website and share those around as well. And um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here, um, Christy and Tammy. A pleasure as always and hopefully we'll have you back uh, to talk more about edition nine in, in the future maybe we'll see where those uh, that over and under came in tammy on uh, the scores <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm going to go ahead and wrap things up for today so on behalf of pgfsi uh, i wish you all a excellent rest of your week stay safe stay healthy and now that we're in the summer stay cool out there we'll see you on another webinar have a great day <laughs>